Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck Part 33. The third day of the Battle of Bowmanville would be decisive in the handcuff war. An active Canadian battalion appeared, turned in its ammunition as before, readied itself for the assault helmets on with bayonets and baseball bats as usual. Three buildings had still to be stormed, numbers 1, 2 and 4. Soon the struggle broke out around them. Barricaded they had been for days, with tables and beds upended against doors and windows, and behind them the defenders, pillows tied on their heads for lack of helmets, bearing as small arms fire axes and tent stakes, and as projectiles jars of marmalade. Where the Canadians could not break through the doors and windows, they climbed to the roofs, cut holes in them and dropped through into hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was a marvelous brawl. Stones, jars, vases flew, water spurted from fire hoses, bayonets stabbed, wooden clubs struck bodies indiscriminately, blood flowed. Unconscious men lay all around, flooded cupboards spit their water back out, glass splintered and tinkled. Inevitably, the Canadians emerged the victors. Wasn't it a wonderful fight? They said. The German officer wounded by a bayonet looked up at the Canadian who had posed a question. He saw only a single eye in a red waist that once had been a face. It was quite all right he replied. The total wounded of the Battle of Bowmanville numbered 44 German prisoners and 38 Canadians. Even though in the end we lost, we had at least shown our spirit and made the handcuffing of our army comrades not so easy. And this turned out not to be so bad after all. The ritual required those concerned to appear in the morning to have handcuffs put on and in the evening to have them removed. And so they did, except that, with the resourcefulness that prisoners of war cultivated, they quickly discovered how they could remove them for themselves, for example, slide the handcuffs connecting chain along the edge of an iron bedstead, give a gentle twist on the wrist, a strong tuck, and the chain sprang apart. This procedure caught on and soon the Canadians had to use another type of handcuff. But these too could be slipped off and lay around uselessly all day long. In the evening, they were fastened on again, in time to be officially removed. In the meanwhile, efforts to negotiate an end to the handcuff war were keeping the international wires hot. The belligerents involved, their protecting powers and the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Carl J. Burkhardt, made one proposal after another to no avail. Finally, on December the 12th, the British lifted the handcuff order. Thus, the handcuffing era at Bowmanville ended at 1300 hours on December the 12th. However, the German government for its part held stubbornly to the handcuffing of the original selected British prisoners of war. And it would be a long time until it declared its readiness to reach a similar understanding with Burkhardt. At last, on November 20th, 1943, Reich Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop consented to the ending of the handcuffing episode on the German side under the prerequisite of strict discretion. German prestige must not suffer in consequence. In Bowmanville, the handcuff war had a bureaucratic epilogue. The Canadians charged the Germans damages for the government property destroyed in the battle. They wrote to German camp leadership, $80,000 from you, payable from the current allowances of the officers. The Germans countered, and from you, $80,000 for damages to German property and missing souvenirs. This went on back and forth for a while. In the end, both sides renounced all financial claims from the Battle of Bowmanville, ratifying the agreement with all due formalities. For the time being, what remained were holes in windows and doors, traces of the battle of past days. Icy Canadian winter storms blew into the quarters, driving snow onto tables and beds. We patched things up best we could, but the major repairs could be accomplished only by the Canadian camp administration. It did so, if more than slowly. Not until the spring of 1943 were the last damages resulting from the Battle of Bowmanville made good. In the meanwhile, suddenly and without a transition period, the sunny autumn weather that still prevailed in the days of the Battle of Bowmanville had come to an end. As fitting for a Canadian winter, our camp was soon buried in snow. Outdoor activities gave way to occupation in our quarters, to instruction and studies. Contributing to this was the fact that the year 1942 did not appear to have brought a decision in the German campaign in Russia or an end to the war any closer. All estimates of the length of our captivity were lost in uncertainty. It was therefore no wonder that more and more officers devoted themselves to studies of long duration and that new study and interest groups took form. Besides our law, we soon had an economics faculty, other subjects also found their fanciers. Mathematics, medicine, botany, history, philosophy, foreign languages and literature, music, graphology and shorthand, to name only a few. 
Such tendencies increased from then on on a year later, in the winter of 1943 to 1944, the German camp leadership directed every occupant of the camp to take part in a winter study group or else to submit an independently prepared academic treatment of a subject of one's own choosing the following spring. I restricted myself to my law studies, which sufficed to fill my days, but soon added shorthand to them. The reason was to be able to write faster during lectures. Later, interested linguistically, I also learned English stenography, the so-called Pittman system. This phonetically constructed method rewarded me with the additional advantage of perfect instruction and pronunciation. For the reproduction of an English word according to Pittman also indicates its correct pronunciation and thereby one can correct himself in individual cases. All of this did not detract from our athletic activities, quite the contrary. In a big gymnasium, men did acrobatics on the equipment, climbed ropes, bounced on trampolines, performed gymnastics with and without medicine balls and played fast-paced basketball. What a sweat this can work up. In an adjoining building was the heated swimming hall with shower room ready for use all day long. Swimming competitions were held from time to time. Outside, the courts used for tennis during warm weather were converted for ice sports and carefully kept in condition for them. A vigorous hockey game was the rule, but a place was reserved for figure skaters. To be on the ice on a still sunny day with a temperature of minus 5 degrees centigrade, truly heavenly. We could also skate at night under artificial illumination. Skiers made long runs over the hilly terrain outside the camp, there were even little slopes. Indeed, we could keep ourselves in good condition, physically and mentally, at the Bowmanville camp. There were scarcely grounds to complain over their living conditions. Through the intercession of our international patrons, our intellectual life was soon enriched by weeks-long lecture series and individual presentations by foreign guest professors. They came mostly from the University of Toronto, only 60 kilometers away. Their subjects? The American Revolution, the Constitution and History of the USA from 1800 to 1850, Characteristics of French Canada, Indians of Canada, History of Canadian Transportation, the English novel from Defoe to Dickens, great English authors, and after the lectures there was sometimes an opportunity to ask questions. Participation in these events was generally lively. I attended nearly all of them, then enjoyed reading up for myself on the subjects treated. If we were rich in anything, it was time. Yet no other professor left so deep and long-lasting an impression on me as Professor D. J. McDougall, a historian at the University of Toronto who had been blinded in the First World War. His knowledge was immense and profound. When he spoke, man and message were the same. He lectured not only at Bowmanville but at other camps as well on characteristics of the British constitution and its reforms in the 19th century, the British government and the cabinet system, the Labour Party, Cromwell and the problem of military dictatorship, British rule in India, constitutional principle of the Commonwealth, all viewed from the perspective of a constitutional historian and sociologist. Time and again he cited what he perceived as the fundamental principle of government. That which concerns all should be determined by all. I told myself that as long as I lived I would never forget this theorem so far removed from the reality of the Reich where such constitutional postulates had been extinguished. MacDougall always closed his presentation with an hour for questions and increasingly lively discussion. It was on such an occasion that in private conversation with Franz Schad, MacDougall made respectful mention of the German historian Franz Schnabel. He knew many of the works of his native of Mannheim, above all of course his Deutsche Geschichte im 19. Jahrhundert, the German history in the 19th century. Esteemed the liberal traditions of Western Germany alive in the author of these works, his firm support of the Weimar Republic, his early independence of historical judgment. It had fascinated him that Schnabel wrote German history not in purely national terms but in a European context, Germany as a European nation before the background of European events. Sooner than many historians on the North Atlantic continent, MacDougall had recognized Schnabel's wisdom and political maturity and regarded him as a man of the stature of Leopold von Ranke, the 19th century German historian who was regarded as the founder of modern historical methodology. The deeply humanistic way of thought evident throughout Schnabel's works had made a strong impression on MacDougall the humanist, just as had the accuracy with which Schnabel described and evaluated English historical phenomena on MacDougall the Anglo-Saxon. That Schnabel's fears for the freedom of the individual in the approaching age of the masses had not met the approval of the Brown authorities, that indeed his whole direction led in 1936 to his dismissal from the position of full professor at the Technical College in Karlsruhe, raised him still higher in McDougall's eyes. 
He believed that through his works Schnabel had saved the honor of German historians. Schnabel's tenets were also his. The true value of the past can temporarily be obscured, but never destroyed. For whoever lives must die, but the great bearers of the German state and the German spirit have done more than merely live. In the 19th century too, they have concerned themselves with eternal values. Personally, MacDougall was refined and charming. He cast his spell even over men who were rather remote to his subjects or themes. After I assumed my office as Consul General of the Federal Republic in Toronto in April of 1968, I was moved to seek him out to thank him again, also in the name of the countless other prisoners of war whose lives he had enriched. In his unassuming way, the professor brushed it off. He had only done the obvious. Despite all our studies in sports, we would hardly have been able to endure year after year at Bowmanville without access to the fine arts. The camp's occupants included musicians and soon a symphony orchestra about 50 men strong was formed. We obtained musical instruments and scores through the aid of the Red Cross in various countries, the YMCA and the representatives of our protecting power. The latter even went to the trouble of having some privately owned instruments shipped from the homeland. In June 1943 I was delighted to take delivery of my violin, which had been sent from Germany at the beginning of March. When at times scores became difficult to obtain, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra helped out in individual cases. Our orchestra's regular conductor and instructor was a concert pianist who also composed. The concert master was the Austrian, who had been at Shep Wells, who had made many public appearances at home before the war. I remember the distant violin of my school days and now played it and later also the viola in the orchestra. The cells of the camp guardhouse stood at the disposal of those who wished to practice unless the chance presence of a delinquent precluded such usage. Every day from one to three hours of practice to scale the technique of bowing and then from etude to etude. I should have practiced with this consistency and the understanding that age brings in my younger years, I told myself again and again when I found how hard it is for a man in his thirties to get anything new out of his fingers and wrists. But the only thing that mattered was to enjoy making music. Thus, many evening rehearsals in the orchestra rolled by, the big gymnasium was the place for them as well as for public performances. We played symphonies by Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, one or another movement by Brahms, works of Bach and Handel and also compositions by our conductor. The latter and our concertmaster gave solos. There were also request concerts. Beside the big orchestra, we formed a smaller one for pop music and dance music. The best instrumentalists united in a chamber music group, a rich musical life came into being. The performances brought never-ending joy. Many may have counted them among the happiest hours of their prison life. I certainly did, with the advantage, even during rehearsals, of allowing myself to be enveloped in and carried away to the world of our classical and romantic composers. Special enthusiasts could also enjoy recorded music of the highest international renown. Gramophones and records could be purchased through the camp canteen. I often heard the foremost solo violinists, cellists and pianists of that day. We also put on plays. The performances included dramas, comedies, farces and puppet shows. Curtains, costumes, wigs and all the requisites were conjured from next to nothing. The resourcefulness and craftsmanship of some individuals achieved true triumphs. The actors, all amateurs, played their role with insight and dedication. All the female parts were necessarily filled by men, which in general caused no problem and sometimes even added to the charm. The evenings were a great success before an audience that hungered for any sort of diversion. Recitations and readings also found their visitors. As a rule, we could see German and American films two or three times a week. The German ones often gave us a chance to revisit familiar scenes. The American ones acquainted us with practically the entire modern US film production, which until now had been virtually close to us. Social, adventure, mystery, musical and war films. Their style of English might make understanding difficult in some cases, but this was not a serious obstacle. The quality of the films varied greatly, from masterpieces of scriptwriting, directing and acting to absolute nonsense. Unforgettable to me remain the war film The Sullivans, which told the story of five brothers who were assigned to the light cruiser Juno and were all lost when the ship was sunk in the Pacific in 1942, and the dance films with Fred Astaire. Up to then, only little known in Germany, the master dancer with the unique style was at the peak of his career. I never let pass an opportunity to admire his elegantly aesthetic movements, perfected to the last detail by relentlessly disciplined practice. Linguistically a delight were the films of George Sanders. His appearance of elegant corruption and his marvelously cultivated English made him one of the most sought-after Hollywood stars in the 30s and 40s. 
Many highly talented men engaged in painting and arts and crafts. Brilliant works of art and craftsmanship were created and could be viewed in exhibitions. Never cramped, especially not in summer, was the time for the already mentioned sports. Many different kinds could be practiced on Bowmanville's spacious grounds. Handball, football, volleyball and hockey, bruising as always, tennis, athletics, gymnastics. Day in, day out, there was a flourishing athletic life, which was stimulated by competitions such as foot races. Amateur gardeners had the chance to combine physical activity with the joy of growing things in the outdoors, as their carefully tended flower and vegetable gardens announced. In the greenhouse, they could work the whole year through. Anyone who wanted to swim in Lake Ontario could do so upon giving his word of honor not to try to escape. On one's word of honor, it was also possible to go on long walks through the thinly settled neighborhood of the camp. Of course, all activities outside camp were under Canadian surveillance. We found the Canadian climate with its long winters and correspondingly short summers to be quite extreme. In summer, the often intense heat sometimes provoked monstrous thunderstorms. The sky would grow dark and dismal, the most dazzling lighting would flash through it and hailstones the size of hen's eggs would beat down. On many such occasions, the ground was covered by a foot of ice. In winter, the country was frequented by blizzards and raging snowstorms, yet in our feudal Bowmanville quarters we were relatively well protected from such extremes. On many evenings the northern lights appeared in the sky. Strange glowing beams and bundles like changing stage curtains played across the sky. This spectacle always captivated us. The most beautiful of all Canadian seasons was autumn, the Indian summer that began punctually in the first half of October. The deciduous forest that surrounded the camp, maples and still more maples, glowed to the edge of the horizon in red and gold. The radiant sun was alluring in its taciturn splendor. Were there escapes, as had taken place earlier at Shab Wells and were indeed the order of the day in every prison of war camp? Of course there were, cleverly staged, one of which I have sketched in connection with the British surveillance methods at Cockfosters. But like it, none of them achieved the aim of reaching Germany. I will not record them here, but they have been described at length. In detail and very suspensefully in Reinhard Stallmanns Die Ausbrecherkönige von Kanada, which is The Breakout Kings of Canada, and also in part in Paul Carell's Die Gefangenen, which is The Prisoners. As a result of the distance and the Battle of the Atlantic, the delivery of our personal mail took much more time than it had in England. To this was added the usual delay of censorship. Letters from Germany needed two or three months to reach Canada, they moved faster in the opposite direction. Towards the end of the war, the delivery time increased greatly. Mail did not arrive for a year or more, the connection was largely or completely broken. Then, the flight of much of the German population and the chaos and destruction in the homeland led to an eloquent silence. So, the Battle of Bowmanville is over and what an interesting altercation it was. Even after the fact, everyone conducted themselves gentlemanly. Quite a contrast to other camps on different side, I must say, and same goes for the life in the camp in general. Sometimes it reads more like a summer camp or a sanatorium instead of a prison of war camp, actually. But not all is well, and we will learn about this in the next episode. Cheers, bye bye.